Guys, what's going on? Welcome back to another episode of the Arsenio Buck Show. If today or tonight or the afternoon is your first time tuning in, man, welcome to the party. It's all about personal development. It's always about the transgressions and somehow harnessing that into something constructive and going after for what it what is yours in the universe? That's pretty much what I talk about. But you know what? Today is not about me. Today is about the other man that's on the other side of this screen, man. Straight out of London, UK, man. We got this guy with true potential. We're going to be talking about storytelling today. But we're also going to be diving into some dark spots. Of course, I have no problem diving into, you know, what I've endured throughout the course of my life and whatnot. You guys already know that story. If it's your first time tuning in, you guys better strap on. Man, introducing you today, some Perry Powers. What's going on, Perry? Bro, what an introduction, man. <laughs> what an introduction. I'm getting better. That was huh? awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's awesome, man. You're giving me a run for my money. Uh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm doing really good, man. It's What's the time here? It's like... Just gone one o'clock in the afternoon, still a full day ahead of me, busy day. But um, yeah, man, thank you for having me on. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks a lot, man. So, man, I want you to tell the people who you are from the very beginning to, you know, what's going on right now. And, of course, we're going to be diving into the art of storytelling. Yes. Okay. So, what is my story? Golden question, <laughs> right? A good um, one. Oh, yeah. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> so, cool. Right. So... Uh, born and raised in London, in the UK. Um, come from a, a broken home. So my mum left when I was like four or five. My, leave my dad to raise me um, for, for a while. Went to went to school, normal school. Um, had had ambitions from a very young age to be an actor. Um, to have a have a big acting background. Um, and it's a, a side that I'll be diving back into when the time is right. Um, but that's played a big part of my life because you learn so much from performing, from, from characterization, from emotions and, and storytelling as well. So like, that's why my forte is, is really derived from my acting experience because it's all about storytelling, which is really cool. Mm -hmm. um, now, so I, a big part of my story, right, is when I was 10 years old for about a year or so, um, over a handful of times, I, I used to get sexually abused by my granddad. Um, by my nan's husband. And um, so that was, that was a dark spot in my life. And it was, a, it was a time that I kept quiet for nearly 14 years, right? And um, now, when it was happening, but just after, like, I remember when I was 10 and I was staying around my nan's house and they just put me to bed in the spare bedroom. And I remember looking at my nan and Michael and I was just like, I hope Michael doesn't come in tonight because that was the first time I actually slept around there and I didn't know what he was going to do at night time, you know. Luckily, luckily he didn't do anything. It was fine. He didn't come in, luckily. Um, but my dad ended up finding out. Now, I, that memory is a bit hazy for me. Um, I got like little flashbacks when we were in a car and the conversation was just flowing and and I think he asked me a question because I think he may, I don't know, but he may have an, uh, an idea that something might have been going on. But he asked me a question and I spoke about it. And that, you know, my dad was like, what? What did you just say? Kind of thing. And I told him about it. And he went around and confronted him. He obviously denied it. And um, he, he never allowed me to go around there again. But a couple of months later, he, Michael, passed away from a heart attack at work. So I never saw him again. Um, Whoa. Yeah. And uh, then... When that happened, I decided to put that part of my life, that chapter of my life, I decided to put that away into, you know, a lot of us can relate to this. I decided to put it away into a chest in the back of my mind. Mm. Lock it, throw away the key, right? I mean, how many of your listeners, even you as well, Sinio, how many, how many memories do we decide to do that, right? You know, I got so many coming back right now after hearing that story, you know? Yeah, it's... um. So I, I, I decided to do that, you know, but, and to, to, now here's the thing, like I was probably 11 when I decided to, to not talk about it, but at the age of 11, I didn't decide to hide it because I was afraid of judgment. I, I think I was too young to understand that thought process, right? Mm -hmm. I just decided to not talk about it because I'm an 11 year old kid and you don't really talk about it at school. You know, you're like, you, you, that's not a topic that you, that you bring up in day-to-day -day conversation. Yeah, really. So that's why I decided to not talk about it. Because I'd rather go away and play with my with my wrestlers and watch WWF and yeah, yeah, and do all that sort of stuff, right? Yeah. Um. So yeah. So I never talked about it, and like I said, I kept it 
in my mind for 14 years now. I never, I wouldn't think about it every single day, nothing like that, because I'd live my life uh, as a normal human being. But every now and then, I'll get flashbacks, or somebody will say something. I see something on the TV. I hear a song that would remind me of that time, and I'll get taken back to that time, right? And each time I get taken back to that time, I'd submerse myself in in that chapter of my life. And then I started to, over these years, I started to hate myself more. I started to judge myself for not talking out about it and letting it happen for nearly a year. And and really, you know, not liking who was looking back at me in the mirror. And it would affect my intimate relationships, affect how I see myself and, and you know, the limitations that I put on myself. And that started to happen, right? And then, um, and then to sort of take a bit of a sh- uh, transition here, so growing up, me and my dad, we were best friends, right? Like we were, you know, absolutely best friends. We had a great relationship. And um, I was his best man at his wedding, which is really cool. I was like, wow. I don't know how old. I was young, like 10, 11, 12 years old. And I was the best man at the wedding, which is cool. Wow, that's awesome. <laughs> and yeah, that is awesome. And um, <clears throat> so, we, yeah, we, we were, you know, really, really close, best friends. And which caused us to butt heads a lot and argue. I'm, I'm sure many children and their parents do that. Yeah. You, you know, your listeners can relate, right? Um, sure. Because my dad was very set in his ways in terms of how he think about things. Yeah. And um, and then about four years ago, he started to go downhill. Now I moved out of home. I went traveling, and um, which really took a a toll on him because I was his in his mind. I was his only friend. He didn't feel like he had any friends, even though he did. But like that, that's the thing, right? We can have so many friends, but still feel alone. Absolutely. You know? Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Um, and he, he, he felt alone. And, he, you know, he would turn to me for things. And when I, went, when I moved out of home and traveling, he felt like a big chunk of him was ripped apart, right? Wow. And then I went traveling around Australia, around Hong Kong. My girlfriend at the time came back home. But I didn't actually, I, I got my own place. Me, you know, me and my girlfriend at the time, we got our own place. So I wasn't able to see um what was going on at home like i wasn't able to see firsthand him going downhill so basically he started to go downhill he started to drink a bit more started to become more negative in the mind and wasn't eating right um <clears throat> and then that happened over the course of three years like i remember he would tell me at times so to fill up the empty vodka bottles with water and put it back in the cupboard so my mom wouldn't find out right right things like that and um now i knew he had an issue but like it was, it was like our private thing. Like I felt like if I was to talk to mum about it, if I was to snitch on him, as he would probably call it, like mm. I'll be stabbing him in the back, kind of thing. So that's why I never talked about it, and I never saw it as a, as a huge problem. Mm. Um, but then when I moved, like I said, when I moved out of home, I couldn't see it firsthand. But I knew I was a pro at knowing when he was drunk. Like I could see the signs, whether his left eyelid will be slightly closed more than his right one. I, I will know that he's started to have a drink, but I could see mm-hmm. it. Um, and then Christmas time, two years ago, he had a seizure in a restaurant. Luckily, there was an off-duty paramedic wow. near a couple of tables down. Yeah, that could come on and save the day. Um, wow. But ever since that happened, I mean, he was going down a gradual downhill slope yeah. over the course of three years. But Christmas time, two years ago, that was it. It was like, essentially, it was like game over for him. Like he had given up. What? You know, why I think why he did he re- give up? I don't, under- I don't understand. What? Ha- I, I feel like, like when I say given up, like, you know, when that happened, he started to drink a lot more. And I, I feel like, I feel like because I don't, I could be wrong here because, you know, I want to get onto why, but like, maybe it's because he'd lived his life and he felt like he was invincible. And he realized that when that seizure happened, that anything can get to him, you know? And it just made him feel less of a man because my dad was the man's man. He was, um, you know, I, I call it, you could call it toxic masculinity, but like he would never open up and he would use alcohol to to numb his vulnerability. Sure. Yeah. And um, when he has that seizure, you know, men are meant to be warriors and, you know, maybe he felt like it, it really impacted him. Mm. So he would become a recluse at home and like he just became very negative. Um in his own mind, not necessarily to, to people, but just to himself. Um, and he'd be you know, a victim to life, right? Victim to his story. But he had the seizure. And then a couple of months later, he became a diabetic. And then, um, and then, yeah, I know. And then June the 1st, 2017, so the last year, I remember I got, a, I got two texts from my brother, who's 13 at the time, right? He, he was living at home, where well, still is. 
um, two texts from him. One was a picture of an ambulance van outside my home, a family home. And then one was a picture of my dad on the bed with a paramedic, well, two paramedics standing next to him. So I called him up. Well, called up my mum. That like, was going on. She goes, Perry, don't worry about it. Don't worry. He's um, basically his blood sugar levels, because he's diabetic, blood sugar levels were just off the chart. So the paramedics have come around. They're just going to take him down to the hospital to even out his blood sugar levels. Mm. Right. I was like, okay, cool. Dad was cracking jokes. And, you know, my mum was like, we're going to go and pop down here after we've finished eating dinner. So, okay, cool. Two hours later, I get a call from my brother and tell me that dad's dead. He had a heart attack in the back of the van on the way to the ambulance, on the way to the hospital. Um, so I remember when I got that call and hearing that my best friend, my dad, had an out of the blue heart attack and just passed away instantly. That's when everything came crashing down, you know, and... And I went through, you know, a lot of people listen to this, you, you know, you, you yourself. I mean, we all have grieving processes, whether it's a loss of a human being, a loss of uh, a location, an item, whatever it is, right? But I went through a grieving process and um, I obviously took it really hard. But I went on a journey of self-discovery, you know, understanding who I am, understanding what my values were in life. And then also reflecting back on on the journey that my dad went through, you know, and I, and seeing his his constant battle as being a victim of life, constantly, you know, using alcohol to numb because I asked him once, why are you drinking so much, Dad? And he said to to fight away the demons. So he had a lot of demons that he was fighting in his life, you know, from from his chapters that he had lived through in his life, where he's made decisions that he weren't proud of. But he he was being a victim to it. He wasn't holding himself accountable and trying to uh, make a, a right out of the wrong, you know? Right. And he was just like I said, you know, I keep saying, but he's just been a victim to it. And, and I went through this journey and then, you know, that's where, that's how I got to where I am now with storytelling because I realized that one of the reasons he got on the bottle and started to drink is because he would never share. He would never be vulnerable. And I noticed that I was doing the same thing with my history of sexual abuse. I wasn't sharing. I wasn't being vulnerable. I wanted to be a man, you know, mm. and I was being a man. I was known for being the man who didn't give a shit about anything. That like, that was me, right? Mm. And um, I, I then realized, you know what? If I I could, I don't know, but if I carry on down this road, I may end up like going down the same road as my dad. Mm. And I was like, I don't want that to happen. So I made an oath and I made a commitment to start living a life full of vulnerability and honesty, transparency, you know, and doing what I want to do from the heart and take off the masks that we all wear and live our vulnerable self. And I decided to do that and build out my personal story. And that's where I am today from, from going through those transitions and being honest with myself and holding myself accountable for what's happened. Wow. So those are, whew, I mean, there's so many different ways I could take this. Um, when it comes down, you, you emphasize that, of course, you know, being a man, you know, being, you, you know, that, that sort of alpha is kind of like the divisive term that so many men have throughout the world to uh what these years these days and whatnot and lewis hose has talked about this and it's kind of like with the drinking you know with your father drinking or any anyone who actually tries to numb the pain they kind of have that invincibility mask on it's kind of like they're not it makes them invincible and so what ultimately mm. happens is i mean they're just not it they keep masking the problem over and over and over like you said rather than sharing and so i think you know of course at the beginning of my personal development journey you know when i went through the things that i had to go through psychologically here in thailand um i started sharing my story now some people probably didn't like it because i probably said some things that you know they they probably fit the description but at that same given moment i was taking off a lot of weight off my shoulder I was speaking my mind freely and I was speaking from the heart. And so what, what, how did you enable yourself at the very beginning? Let's start at the very beginning with the sexual abuse. See a lot of people, I mean, they're not able to overcome this. I mean, there are, I mean, you just hear some of the stories that run rampant over the last year, you know, there are uh, out here in Thailand, out there in uh, Myanmar, the women killing themselves because a video was caught of them on this and that. It's just, It's horrific. People go down the wrong road rather quickly. I mean, there's a movie that I love so much to this day, still my favorite movie of all time, Antoine Fisher. He was sexually abused. 
His father was killed at the doorstep of his girlfriend's place. His mother left him at a hospital. This was all based on a true story. And so, of course, when he gets older and old, older, all this aggression and that aggression mask, he starts harnessing it within him. And it gets worse and worse and worse to the fact where he's not able to engage in everyday conversation and everyday disputes because he blows up. And there's always a chapter of his life that comes forth that he has to actually take on. So how did you begin to do that? I mean, did, of course, you didn't tell your friends. I'm not sure if you did in terms of, you know, being sexually abused. But how did you when did it begin? Well, begin to um, you start to tell to someone. Sort of yeah, yeah, yeah. So to tell someone um, it all started, actually, the, the, the first time I actually shared about it. Now, very quickly, um, talk about Lewis Houses. His book, Mask and Masculinity, changed my life. His oh, wow. book, Mask and Masculinity, there you go. Um, got me to actually know that there was a such thing as masks, you know? So I owe so much to the guy, so much. Um, his history is quite similar to mine. And yeah. like, I owe so much to him because he opened my eyes up to, my dad was wearing the invincible mask. My dad was wearing a stoic mask. The stoic and then mask, I, was, I came to, yeah. And I came to realize, I was like, hold on a second. I've been wearing so many masks. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, and I've been wearing, um, you know, a, a lot of the, the sexual masks as well. And oh. that was a big part of my life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, um, I, I kind of, yeah, yeah, yeah. But of course, being here in Thailand, <laughs> I see it on people and it terrifies me. But go on. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah. yeah. And then, um, but going back to to what you said, so I went to, so I, I've got, um, I'm a, a fitness coach as well, right? So I became a personal trainer like three and a half years ago. Um, I'm an online fitness coach. I work with parents, um, but I I went to a mastermind event. It's a five day uh, retreat uh, over here in the UK, and um, it was for to t- it was to take like fitness trainers and and get their business online, basically. Mm. So I went to this mastermind event, and and this this was the, like a, a defining moment for me that I was I was on the couch and there was five of us. It was an intimate um, retreat and. It was, um, and so I, I was with these five people and they said, right, so it's time for you guys to go around and share who you are. Talk about yourself. Okay. Right. Okay. Now I was, I was on the edge of this side. So they were either going to start with me or they were going to end with me. Right. And, uh, luckily they, they started on the other side. So I was last. Ooh. Now I couldn't hear words anybody was saying. Because I was thinking to myself, what am I going to share, right? And, I, and then I got confused because I, I was like, well, hold on a sec. Why am I asking myself, what am I going to share? I'm not going to talk about the abuse because I haven't talked about that in so long. Why would I even think about talking about it now? But it's like just the setting. And I just feel like, you know, I've paid this money and, and I feel like that this is the right thing to do. And like, I, being, I remember being really scared. I felt like I was sinking into the sofa because I'm like, I'm sure. Yeah. I'm going to be sharing a part of myself that I haven't done in so long. And all these years, I've been fearing that as soon as I share it, people are going to judge me. People are going to hate me. I'm like, who is this weirdo who would let this happen for over a year, right? And it got to me, like, right, Perry, so talk to us a little bit about yourself. And I remember, like, I just, I didn't say anything to begin with. And then I just started to talk, but not knowing what I was going to say, I just started to talk. And then I just talked and I just said that, I, you know, I've got, a history of being sexually abused and that's caused me. And I basically, what I've just shared already with you on this, uh, on this podcast, right. that's what I shared with the guys there. And I was so surprised that I came out and said it. And when I did say it, there was like silence when I finished. And then the, um, my coaches and mentors, they were just like, wow, first of all, Perry, thank you for sharing that. And that was the first time I've been thanked for sharing it, mainly because that was the first time I shared it. But then the people that were there, they came over to me after, like, thank you for so much for sharing. I'm like, you really opened up the group. And then that got me to think, it was like, this is interesting. Mm. I've just received love. I've just received yes. appreciation. Yeah. Um, I wasn't outcasted, which I was, which was one of the things I'd be scared of. You know, I was scared that I'd feel lonely and be outcasted as an outsider. And they welcomed me, you know, into the family. Right. And when I finished this, mastermind i was driving home it's like a two and a half hour drive and i just think to myself the whole journey right, right. i was just like perry you're you're in this mindset right now you know when you go to this mastermind you're in a submersive mindset right and when, when 
And we all know like we can't have this 100% mindset 100% of the time because we're not robots, we're human beings. We dip it in and out. Sometimes it's higher, sometimes it's a bit lower, right? right. But I was in this peak of, of highness of like mindset and just willing to just do anything. Yeah. And I was driving, I was like, whilst I'm in this, this moment, Perry, share your true self. Yeah. And, and then I was questioning, I was like, right, do I share it to friends? Do I share it to family? But I was like, but I'm going to be just repeating it over and over and over. Perry, just dive into the deep end. Share it to the world. Yeah. And I was like, I was like, that's basically creating a video, putting it on Facebook, telling everybody, two, three thousand friends, my followers, my history of everything, of my sexual abuse, of my dad passing away, of me hating myself and my journey. And I was getting scared, right? And I was like, hey, just do it. I pulled up the car, go into some place. And I, I put the this phone on the happened. dashboard. Yeah, yeah, this just happened. Oh, okay, okay, this is another one. All right, gotcha, gotcha, go on. What, what was you going to say? No, I thought, I just saw a video just recently where you actually shared that part of, of course, your grandfather, you know, and you were saying, please don't come in, yeah. please don't come in. Yeah, yeah. This wasn't the same video, yeah. right? No, okay, no, no. Okay, so okay. this, no, no. Okay. So this this video is like, I, I recommend you watch it because this one is um, a sense of rawness that I couldn't replicate because that was the first time I was sharing it. Mm. So like just just the atmosphere that was put, that was portraying through the camera, which was unintentional, mm. is is you know some people said it's quite unsettling, but it's raw. Mm. And this this video was about seven eight months ago, I think. Um, and so I pulled up the car, put the video in, and I just started to talk. Now every time I was talking, I was crying, and I'd delete the video, right? And they took me to like I think seven six or seven takes of the video. Right. By this time, I don't think I was crying anymore because I was cried out. Right, right, right. right. And, okay, uh, okay. <laughs> he said I was crying then, out. Um, Tears are gone. Uh, yeah, bro. Yeah, it was all, yeah. it was all gone. The tank was empty. And uh, the seventh or eighth take, I had recorded it. It was like 17 minutes long. And I had the video. It's like, Perry, press the post button. Press the post button. Just do it. Just do it. And like my finger was going to it. And my finger was going away from the phone. And I just, I just did it. I, I posted it. And I had it there. And, and I'm just seeing it. Like, I'm seeing this process. I'm watching it be posted on Facebook. Yeah, yeah. I'm watching it get its first view, its yeah. second view. I'm like, guys, oh, I put the phone down temporarily thinking, am I, am I going to regret this? Because not everybody knows who I am. Yeah. Nobody can see this mask because I don't have a mask mm. anymore. I'm letting them see who I, who I am as a human being, mm. right? My authentic, true self. Mm. And, um, you know, I'm letting everybody know what my personal story is. And I look at my phone again after thinking it had over 100 views. It had two likes and one comment. Now, here was my thought process right then. I was like, over 100 views, but I've only got one comment. That means 99 people minimum hate what I'm saying. They don't agree with it. You know? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah? Right. So I'm looking at this, and then I'm like, I'm going crazy. I throw my phone in the back of the car. I'm like, no. I'm like, everyone's going to hate me. And basically what I've been thinking for the last 14 years sure. is coming into, uh, into reality is what I was thinking. Mm. I drive home, and then... As soon as I get home, so like 20 minutes later, I look at my phone, boom. It had hundreds of views, like over 50, 60 comments, so many messages, and it was all love. It was all love. People loving me, people saying, wow, thank you for sharing it. People giving some guidance. And then all of a sudden, I got this message the next day. I woke up to a message. And this is where it changed, by the way. So this will be of some value. So this is where it changes. Like I got a message from somebody in America. There's a guy in America. And he was on one side of America. His family was on the other side, right? Mm-hmm. Now, his family on the other side, there was a particular family member who was going downhill. He never uh, dived in on what he meant by that, but it, maybe it's to do with health or whatever it is, but it's going downhill. Yeah. And they wanted him to fly over to be with his family member. But the thing is, this guy, this entrepreneur, he was on this side of America, the other side, chasing his dreams. You know, he was chasing, he was in his element. And he just didn't feel like it was the right thing to do to fly over. And there was this bad tension going on. And he put himself into this really dark space, this dark negative mindset. But listening to my story and being true and being honest, took him out of that dark and brought him into light. And he said how much it helped him. And I remember seeing this message and I was crying because I was like, this is something I didn't expect. Because here's the thing, I created my personal story and I shared it for me, yeah, for no one else. Absolutely, I shared it for me, Yep, you know? And then I didn't know that there was this possibility of even helping people. I didn't see that far, mm-hmm. which is, I think is a good thing because I wasn't in it for the wrong reasons. Right. You know, good. people will share things and hoping for something to come out on the other side. And that's just horrible. You shouldn't do that. And right. it probably won't happen if you do go down that road. 
Yeah, you know, I agree. Um, so I did it for myself. And then I got this message. I was like, wow, I'd helped somebody in a completely different country to me. I don't know how much I helped him. It could be little, or it could be really big. I don't know how much I helped him, but I helped him in some way. I was like, I need to continue doing this. I need to continue sharing my personal story because I never know who it's going to help. Wow. I never know what ears it's going to lay on because yeah. my voice could be the message that somebody needs to hear. My voice gives people the permission that they need in order for them to share their story. Sure. And then that's what got me to where I am today. Wow. Hey, oh, man. It, you know what? It's when we're, man, it's kind of like, you know, Lisa Nichols, she is phenomenal at storytelling. And I remember when she told her story in front of, uh, on Steve Harvey show about her son, her being so broken, broken, had no money for diapers. And she had her son, of course, on the bed with no diaper, had a towel wrapped around him and she made a promise to him. And so when we go to the, I mean, the depths, I remember October, 2014, that still being my darkest month. Applying to over a hundred jobs and having like 40 replies come back saying, sorry, we do not accept black teachers at this school. Having all that happen, oh, wow. bear down on my conscience and then really just become so broken to the point that I sent a very horrifying text message to my best friend who immediately responded and said, what? It was just a bunch of bleep saying, what the hell are you talking about? Did I, I realized that, you know what? There's, I, I had no idea what personal development was. I just knew about the secret. You know what I mean? But when we go through so much with your father passing away, with my father dropping me off on the doorstep of a home at, you know, in 1999 and just having my mother take care of me for so long, those moments, it, it, it makes us want to help people because there are mm. other people. It's no longer about us. It's about helping other people because there are so many other people that are going through, have gone through and probably will continue to go through these things, you know, of, of course for the next 100, 200 years and whatnot. So, I mean, it's amazing how we just become aware in terms of, Hey, okay, this happened. I'm going to share my story to let it off my chest because it's a burden. Right. And so yeah. when I had to share the stories about my mother and, you know, my brother always hated me and, you know, my family not speaking to me and this and that. Hey, a lot of people say, oh, that's very personal. <laughs> no, it isn't. I am unapologetic. I have nothing to hide. You have all of me right out there. And I just realized how much it was actually helping people, helping listeners all around the world and whatnot. So and. What a, in storytelling? So, if we go into storytelling, how were you able to tell your story? Is it does your tour does your story still have that same emotion when you first told it the first time? You know, in the car when you had to stop it seven times versus today. How did you end up develop developing that art? Great question. So, um, what I do is. I, with my clients, I go through a process of how you can get your personal story together, which I'll share on, on, on this podcast, which is going to be cool. But, um, in terms of the emotion, which is a great question is, um, I think you'll find that it surprises you because you will share your, let's just say I shared my story today. Hmm. Let's say, for example, I shared my story right now from beginning to end. There will be, there may be a moment where I start to get emotional, but I haven't got emotional at that moment. Pro, like previous, right, you know? Right. So sometimes it just, when you, it's all about riding the emotions, right? So in terms of the very first time I shared it, it was emotion from beginning to end. Mm -hmm. It's not like that now mm -hmm. uh, on the surface, but maybe like deeper, I can, I can sort of inject emotion into it if I wanted to, but then that's when you can get a bit tricky, wasn't it? That's when it's like you're trying to force emotion into your story, mm -hmm. you know? which I think a lot of people try to do that because they're like, well, if I'm going to talk about this memory, it needs to be emotional because it's a dark time. So when I talk about it, I'm going to inject emotion into it to try and help that setting. Right. And that's when I feel, well, well, you shouldn't, it needs to be, you know, if you're talking and it does, you're not getting choky, doesn't, it doesn't matter. Right. You know, your story, the actual words will do all of the work for you. You don't need to do anything else, mm -hmm. you know? So again, like I, you know, sometimes I can share my story and I don't get emotional. But the other times, I could get emotional. It's just you can never 
planet, it just yeah, happens. Exactly, absolutely. It's, yeah. Mm-hmm. Cool. Go on, go on. No, I was going to say, yeah, so that, that's, that's just the... Um, that's just how it is, right? But like, in terms of how to build out your personal story. Do you want me to dive into that now? Sure, sure, sure. Go ahead. Oh, wait, yeah. wait, wait, wait. Well, hold uh, on. Okay, wait. So let, let me... That, that's what I was going to say, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I was like, okay, let me... Okay, so... I... It, wait, so you mentioned real quick, because this just came to mind, your mother, you said your... When when the ambulance and, of course, your father, um, you know, when he had the attack and whatnot, your brother sent you the pictures. You You mentioned your mother... Now, but you said that your mother left you when you were five years old. Is that correct? Yeah. So my, um, I'll give you a quick story on that. So my mom, my biological mom, she left when I was like four or five. She walked oh, out. Okay, okay. I only used to see her maybe once or twice a year mm-hmm. for, for a few years. Mm-hmm. And then it started to pick up again. Now I see her once a month. But when I was, so, so my biological mom, she left when I was five. A couple of years later, my dad met a woman who okay. eventually moved in. Um, and then she was my stepmom, but because I never used to see my biological mom that much, my stepmom stepped into those role. shoes, and then I, be, I called her my mom because she, she played that role, right. you know? Um, so when I say my mom, I'm talking about my stepmom there. Right. Okay, okay, gotcha. And how were you able, I mean, it's just amazing. So your stepmom, luckily, she took the throne after the passing of your father. How were you able to deal with that emotionally? Because as a 15-year-old, I still remember my 15-year-old years. We go through so many stages and whatnot. We're trying to fit in at school. This is happening. That's happening. How were you able to get over? I mean, of course, I mean, it's so difficult to get over the death of anyone. But what did you do to start to... What what was the process for you? 15, 16, 17, 18 years old? Well, it was only last year, so I'm 24 now. Oh, right, yeah, right. Oh, my God, I'm tripping. Okay, yeah, I'm tripping. <laughs> I'm 15, da- I got something else. Okay, right, so it was only last year. So that's when, of course, you went on the personal development, discovery, yeah. and everything. What did it teach you? 15, I got that all switched up. But, yeah, anyways, <laughs> what, did, what did that entire process uh what did the whole self-development teach you? Because, of course, they don't teach this in school. Yeah. Well, this, this is interesting. So I, I started, um, I became an entrepreneur five years ago, you know, mm. and that's when I started my personal development journey five years ago. So that did help me to, quote unquote, handle the process of after my dad passed away. Now, here's the thing. I'm, I'm still handling oh, it, I'm so sure. to speak. I'm and, sure. yeah. so, so, you know, people say, you know, you've lost parents or lost close family members that, you, you know, you'll always be handling it, um, which I'll obviously be experiencing now. Um, but in terms of how I dealt with it, here's, here's the funny thing is that I noticed that I was wearing a mask still, but like indifferent. So I dealt with my dad's death quite bad and my mum said to me you know because in the uk we've got the nhs right which you know free free um healthcare right. and my mum told me to go and get like a, a counselor who would be free to help me through the, the grieving process oh, wow. right okay and um i well i said to her yeah i will yeah but knowing that i wasn't going to go and do that mm-hmm. because now here's the thing i didn't not go and do it because I was a man and I didn't want to be seen to be weak. Nothing like that. I didn't do it because in my head, my thought process was I've been on a self-development journey for over four years. I should be able to handle this. You see? Yep. That was my thought process. Yep. As I, I've read the books. I'm reading. I'm doing the courses. I got mentors. I should be able to handle this. And um, that was just, you know, I, if I went and got help, would I have dealt with it much quicker and on a, easier level of course right but um i still handled it myself now oh dude in terms of how i handled it i don't even know man i don't even know how i handled it i just yeah. rode the, the the wave of emotion you know i went through the uh, i went through disbelief not believing it was happening yeah then i then like moved into like shock then moved into hatred i was hating myself and i started to think back on the times of like the, the times i didn't text him back right the words that i would say to him to to cause an argument right. the times i moved away basically i started to look back on all the times i hurt him i started to look back on the times he hurt me and i started to have a lot of hate mm. right 
And then, and then I, and how I got out of that was the biggest part. It is the biggest, biggest part. You could call it a medicine to um, dealing with your past is forgiveness, you know? Mm. And I started to forgive myself, which worked wonders. And I started to forgive my dad. So I started to forgive myself for the wrongs I did. Started to forgive my dad for the wrongs he did. Mm. And I was like, I need to forgive myself for, um, for not talking out when being abused. And that was a big part. That enabled me to heal. That enabled me to talk on podcasts like this, on Facebook Live videos, so freely about the experience because I've already forgiven myself. I, I, don't talk, I don't talk about it and have shame. Right. I forgive myself, you know? Okay. And then I had the, the... Then I was like, do I forgive Michael? And that was where I was like, I don't have to. Don't have to. But do I do that or not? And I was like, do I feel like I can 100% move on if I don't forgive Michael? I was like, I don't. So I started to work on forgiving Michael for sexually abusing me. And that took a while, but I was able to do it. I was able to forgive him, you know? And I don't, I mean, I don't, obviously he did a, a terrible thing, but I was able to forgive him and that helped me move on, which was a big, big part. And, uh, you know what, and you know what's crazy, which also helped me um, enable to, to forgive him is because when I started to share my story, I found out mm. that I wasn't the only one in the family who had been abused by Michael. Oh, whoa. Is that right? Yeah, there was, there was uh, four of us. Damn. Uh, yeah. And now they're, almost, you know, they're not my stories to tell, but my cousin, who is an absolute trooper, she, um, I got her to share her story on Facebook the same way as I did, you know, on, on, a, on a video. And she was the exact same. Michael sexually abused her um, when she was younger. And then, but here's the thing, right? I started to f- dive in a bit deeper on Michael. And have you seen the film Spotlight? Mm, no, I haven't. I won like Oscar's brilliant film, right? It's about, uh, I think, I think if I got the place right, it's in Boston in, in America. And it's about these, this team of reporters. And um, it, many, many years ago, yep. there was a, a priest who had a case of sexually molesting kids, right? And it's this team of researchers that worked for them in the paper. And they wanted to dive in the case of this priest. And basically, it ended up being not just this one priest. It ended up being hundreds and thousands of priests all over the world. What I found out in the credits of... Now, some of you listeners, you may have watched um, Spotlight before... In the credits, just before the credits, they have all of these places that had documented cases all around the world, right? Now, Michael had three siblings. He's got him, his brother, and his two sisters, yeah. okay? They grew up in Ireland. And the sisters grew up in a, I think you could call it a boarding school, which was run by um, nuns. Oh, shit. Yeah? N- n- yeah, you probably see where I'm going with this. Now, the nuns used to physically abuse the girls there including the two, um, two sisters. And Michael and his brother used to be sexually abused by the priests in their all-boys boarding school. Now, Michael used to deny it. He used to say he didn't get sexually abused, but his brother did, and it was his job to, so to protect him. So how I was able to forgive him or help to forgive him is like, you know, either he was sexually abused, and, but he was denying it because he was ashamed, yep. or he was witnessing it from everyone. And instead of using that experience to inspire other people, he decided to do it himself to others, you know? So I found out his background when I decided to be brave, to dive into that dark time in my life where a lot of people decide to shrug it off and put it underneath the carpet and not visit it. I decided to visit it and it helps me move on. Wow. You know, I mean, there are so many instances uh, when you said, of course, when someone is sexually abused when they are younger. I mean, I forgot there have been so many stories over the past year and a half where, unfortunately, those victims fall victim to unleashing those same diabolical methods to other people. And mm. damn, you you know what? That's probably what I would have picked up right off the back because... If I look at it right now for all the – because I see a lot of things out here, Perry. I got plenty of stories. But for those men to come from all around the world to come to come here to Thailand to, of course, sex offend and sexually abuse these young individuals 
something had to go completely wrong in their life. There's always sure. an underlying. I mean, there's. I mean, we just. I mean, that's just how it is. But then, you know, going back to the whole forgiveness part, you know, that's what I really love about my father. Um, haven't spoken to him in 17 years. He tried adding me on Facebook after 17 years this year. And I'm like, uh, yeah, no, you just can't say something. There was no message. There was nothing. I said, you have nothing to say after 17 years. I want, I want at least 34 pages of a novel. You need to tell me why do you want back in? He said nothing. I said, get out of here. And so what I really have to do, what I really had to do, I'm like, I'm blaming my father for me becoming the unbelievable individual I am today. If my father was any better than what he was, I would not be here speaking in front of you right now, this moment. So Mm. it's really hard to look at things from that perspective because, again, abuse and so many things that people who will probably listen to this in the next day, next week, next month, next year, they're probably going to be like, no way, no way, I can't, I can't. But, I mean, Mm. look at your circumstances right now, your environment, you know, you're listening to this. Now you have the opportunity to share your voice. I've heard some of the most relentless stories from another friend out there in Hong Kong. Her mother locked her in a cage. Um, Her mother, oh my God, it was up till 33 years old. You know, normally these things happen when we're very young. She was being pushed to the brink at the cusp of 30 You know, she was made fun of at a French school on her home soil. So many different things happened. And I'm like, you have a story to tell. And so that's when, of course, that's why we need to dive into a little bit of storytelling. Because I believe voices need to be shared. So, (sighs) Mr. Parrot Powers, tell us. Tell us how. So, of course, tell us from the beginning. Like, you know, the art of storytelling. I want you to dive into that right now. For sure, man. So, cool. Let's talk about your personal story. So, for everyone that's listening, right? Um, the first the first thing I want to talk about is mindset. So, you know, there's like five steps to this. But the first step is mindset. Now, the reason why I talk about this is because dealing with people, I've seen, I mean, you know, there's quite a few different types of people. But you'll have somebody who'd be like, okay, I've gone through stuff in my life, but... I don't think there's anything worth sharing, Mm. you know? They'll say that. And usually they'll say that because they've heard somebody else's story Mm. who's quote-unquote worse than theirs and they've compared their own story to them. Mm. They're like, oh, well, my story isn't as bad as that, so what's the point in even sharing it? You get those type of people. You get some type of people who be like, I I haven't had anything going on in my life. I I, I had quite a nice background, raised well, you know, went into my father's business and I've got cash and I've got a nice car, nice house and I'm secure. I don't have anything to talk about. Right. And I don't. And that's what they feel like, right? But here's the thing. Let's just say somebody's listening to this and they're, I don't know, 32 years old. What they need to understand is that they've been on this planet for 32 years. Yeah. They have been through stuff. I don't care what they're saying. They have been through chapters, yeah. whether it's good, whether it's bad, whether, uh, you know, they're proud of things or they're not proud of things. They've been through stuff, man. Yeah. 100%, right? Absolutely. And these things, no matter if they don't think it's big, no matter, I mean, it's the thing. There's no scale on how big or how small it is. It's just the fact that there's someone out there who just needs to know the experience you've gone through, you know, and they just want to know your thought patterns and what they can learn from it. Like there's always going to be someone out there who, would, who needs to listen to your voice. And that's the biggest thing I want to get across to your listeners first mm. is that, you do have a story. Like, I don't care what you say. You've got a story, right? Absolutely. So now we just need to work on honing that story in. Okay. So the first thing, the first step mm-hmm. is chapters. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now I, I tell people to get, I get a piece of paper or to download my guide where you have like squares. So let's just say you've got a piece of paper in front of you. Like you draw out three squares, three squares, three squares. You've got nine big squares, right? Mm-hmm. Now, they represent you looking at your life from a bird's eye view, okay? Now, here's what you need to do is you need to go through your life and you need to pluck out the chapters in your life. Now, what I mean by chapters are, I mean, your life is like a book, you know? Books are made up of chapters. Chapters form the book. Mm -hmm. So your memories you've gone through in your life, your experiences form the person that you are today. 
Now, I'm not talking you remember your mom buying you your first ice cream from the ice cream truck. That's just a pretty memory. Yep. But there's no experiences or lessons attached to that. Right. So have a look through your life. And, you know, like, did you start up this, this college football team, you know, from the ground? Like I did. I went to college and didn't have an American football team because I've got a big love for it because it's not that big in the UK. Right. And I was like, they're like, if you want to set it up. Blame Zoom for that. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, okay. So you said college football, football, not that big in the UK. And then it went. Whack, finish. Oh, okay. Okay, cool. So I said, <laughs> not that big in the UK. So I, I joined college, didn't have a football team. I said, can I set one up? And they said, yeah, but you got to do it yourself. So I had to find the funding. I had to find the, the grounds, the, the coach, the equipment, the players, right. get them into the college league. Now, that was a chapter of my life right. because it's an experience. And attached to that experience was lessons learned. Okay. Okay. Those lessons learned form the person I am today. So have a look through your life. And, you know, you start from when you was a child and work your way through to where you are now. What are the chapters? What are the chapters? Write those chapters down in these boxes. They could be five. They could be 50. It doesn't matter how many there is. Yeah. Okay. Now, what's crazy is that you will, you will not remember all your chapters. Mm. Because when you start to dive into your mind, it will unlock new memories. Mm. When you unlock those memories, they will unlock further memories. Right. So like I was on a call with somebody with my, one of my clients last week and he this is crazy. He was talking about um, a time of his life when he was at college and he was your typical college. I don't know what you call him there. Is it a frat dude? Yeah. Yeah. Frat, frat, dude? Frat, yep, yep. Yeah. Frat boys. Yeah. Yeah. He got the frat boys. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> he, he was a typical frat boy and he was drinking, partying and he, he, he ran himself into the ground. That was a big chapter of his life. Now, here's the thing. I, you know, I, I've been going through my chapters constantly for so, so many months, nearly a year. And uh, that chapter of my life, when I went to university, which is your equivalent of college, um, I only lasted three and a half months. I only lasted one term. I only went to three lectures. I was on my last warning for being kicked out. And that is because I'd watched too many American Pie movies, okay? And I wanted to go there. And party and drink. And I, I was saw that post. Six you went to Kent State. You went to Kent State, right? That's it. In the UK, Kent University. Oh, not, oh yeah. right, right, right. Okay, okay. I thought I said you went to Kent State out there in America. Okay, okay. <laughs> Kent out there in. Okay, okay. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. So yeah, I went to yeah Kent University in the UK, and uh, and I was partying six nights a week, three lectures, right? And then got to a point where I'm like, I'm here for the wrong reasons. Mm. Now I'm here for the wrong reasons, and I need to make a choice. And that choice was to quit university and move back in with my parents. Sure. But that's a big chapter of my life. But that was a chapter that I. Whenever I think of my life, that was always locked away somewhere until I was on my coaching call last week, my client, and he talked about that chapter. I'm like, wow, I had a similar experience. So what I'm trying to say is that you're always going to unlock chapters in your life, yeah. right? Some Which things that are just cool lying experience. dormant. Some things that are lying real deep within the subconscious. It could be anything. Something just comes up that reminds you of a specific event. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Wow. Dude, 100%, man. Um. Now, what I want you to do is, this is where it can get tough for some people, is that when you've written out your chapter, so like, you know, your chapter would be like a title. So for right. me, the chapter I just talked about would be created football team. That's a, that's a title. So I put that at the top of the box. Right. Now, the space that you've got underneath that title, the remainder of your box, what I want you to do is I want you to, that's something that we learn in acting is uh, like emotional memory. Okay, So it's mm. going back to that time. And experiencing, like, get rid of the masks, okay? It's just you. I mean, to go back to those chapters and see what emotions come up. And I want you to write those emotions down. And then I want you to write down how you feel like it's affected the person that you are today and it's brought you to where you are today, okay? Because now what you've got is a whole list of chapters. The name of the chapter, how, it's, how it made you feel, and how it got to you to where you are today, mm-hmm. Okay? Now, you're going to have a whole, a whole host of chapters here. Now, we're going to move on to the next step. And the next step is defining moments. Mm. Defining moments. Okay? This is a big part. Mm. Um, now, what I want you to do is to go over those chapters. Now, you can either highlight them, mm. take them out, put them onto a new piece of paper. But I want you to go through your chapters and figure out which ones were defining moments. And what I mean by defining moments where they were big ones. Like I had like, I think, over 15 chapters. Right. But I've only got two defining moments that got me to where I am today and it's created my vision. And that is my sexual abuse history and that is my father 
passing away. Yep. That's my two defining moments. Okay. Now, I, now, here's the thing. Some people, I, I have this question. But Perry, how do I pick the defining moments? Like, because I've got quite a few chapters that were, that were quite big, you know, pinnacle moments in my life. Now, here's the thing. For the road that you're currently on, which chapters um, gel the most with your vision and where you are today? Those are your defining moments. Because later on in life, 10 years time, if you change paths and you've got this different vision, mm -hmm. then some other chapters of your life may have been your defining moments for you to, to, got to, that, to, to go down that road, if that makes any sense. Yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. So uh, what I want you to do is go through your chapters, take out your defining moments. Now, I have two. In an ideal world, if you can have one defining moment, because mm -hmm. by the way, the next step is your story and your defining moment will form your story, which we'll get into. If you can have one defining moment, then it's going to be such an easier process for you. But I have two. Ideally, don't have any more than three defining moments that will form your story because it just becomes too much. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, sure. Now, once you've got your defining moments, now it's time to build your personal story. Okay. This is the fun bit. Now, I have my two defining moments, right? And then now it's all about doing your own homework. Like, you know, it, it, this part is impossible for me to hold your hand. Like, you need to do this work on your own. And you need to figure out with your defining moment or defining moments, for argument's sake, we'll just say defining moment. With your defining moment, what we need to do is I, want you, I just want you to write down, okay? Get a pen, get a piece of paper. Don't think, oh, it needs to be grammatically correct with full stops or commas. No, don't care. Put pen to paper. I want you to write out that defining moment from beginning to end. Write it out. Mm. Just write it out. Because that could be such a huge transformation for yourself and a lot of your listeners because you're going to start writing it out and these flood of, flood of emotions may come through that you haven't witnessed before, you haven't experienced before, right? right? And you're going to be writing it in such a way because it's one thing to live inside your mind, always reflect on this chapter and this defining moment, but it's another thing to write it out, you know? So once you've written it out, this is going to be like a, a messy draft copy of your story. Now it's all about perfecting that story. So like with me, I wrote it out. I wrote, it, I wrote out two um, of my defining moments, you know, and then I merged them together because there was a link between sexual abuse, keeping it together with wearing a mask, my dad passing away, me realizing that I was going down that same road and me coming out the other side. That was my story. Yeah. Now, you know, the best thing to do, so how I started off my story is saying, I remember when I was 10 years old, Right. And I was and I was staying around my, my nan and granddad's house, and they just put me to bed in the spare room. Like I like I mentioned at the beginning of this podcast, right. that's how I started off my story. Right. Because I took I took the listeners and I took myself back to that time. Right. I remembered how old I was in that defining moment. Uh -huh. Does that make sense? Yep. So, with creating your personal story, it's literally like a short story out of a book. Hmm. So you want to get them back to the time to walk those walk them through that defining moment walk them through how it made you feel walk them through the transformation you made mm -hmm. and then how that's created your vision on how you want to impact the world okay okay repeat that one more time let me get that one more time that little last bit you said start from so when you're creating your personal story i want you to take the people take the listeners take the viewers take yourself through the defining moment itself, okay. that chapter. Yep. Then take them through how it made you feel. Yep. And then take them through your transformation. So take them through how you transitioned through that. And then take them through the vision that this, tra this defining moment has created for you and how you want to impact the world. Yes. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. That becomes your personal story. So my personal story, without going like word for word, like so you've got that sexual abuse, got my, my dad passing away, Moss. I want to impact the world because I want to help all these sexual abuse people out there to know that they're not alone and they can come out into light. I want to help people trump fear, live life without limitations, live life without wearing masks. So what I've gone through has formed my personal stories, formed my vision in to, to shape you know, the vision that I want to impact on this world. And that's how you create your personal story. But just before we finish that, once you've created this process, what I just said there, mm. you're going to start writing this out. Create a few drafts, okay, from beginning to end. You need to get it to flow. Like, imagine, like, you, you know, you're, you're at a, a water park, you're sitting on top of the water slide, you just slide down it. So when you start your story, all the way through to, through to the end, it needs to be a slide. Mm. There can't be any 
Um, yeah, this happened and it needs, it just needs to flow like a story. Because sure. when you can start doing it, you start rehearsing it. Because this is the next step. Like you, you need to start rehearsing your stories and saying it out loud. So it becomes part of who you are. It becomes attached to your cells. It becomes ingrained into you as a human being. And it becomes you. So when you start to communicate it to people, it can have the biggest impact to change lives. There it is. In short, man, I'm probably going to have to bring my boy Perry Powers on again because, boy, we're already running at that one hour mark. But, man, that is good. Oh, wow. That's what I know. I, I'm telling you, it just went right by really quick. Man, I would love to push this more. But, um, of course, people, they might start saying it's too long. But, you know what, I wanted, to, I wanted you to repeat that because as you were repeating that, there was a pinnacle moment last year. Whereas how it made me feel being ostracized by a particular person at work and then seeing what I was truly about. I saw an insecure individual piling on his insecurities saying, oh, I don't think you're good to do this. I don't think you could teach this. I don't think you could teach that. Then I realized, oh my God, he considers me to be a threat. That's why he's saying this. He wants me to stop now by putting like, Pushing all these things onto me, all these ridiculous, myopic points of view onto me. And then now, almost a year later, I'm creating ebooks on this and I'm passing people on these different tests all around all around the planet. It's just remarkable. That's why I wanted you to repeat that again. Guys, oh man, Perry, you know, we're gonna have to bring up Perry to motivational mentors. Guys, if you're not following that, my boy Perry, he'll be on probably within the next three weeks because man, you got we gotta go over storytelling again. We just had so much to talk about, you know? Yeah. Oh yeah. man. So okay, I'm gonna give you one last question before we top this off. What's the impact? You are you went through hell and back just last year, going up through, you know, through everything you had to face and what so many of us have to face on different scales. We can't really can't judge on what scale it is, but what's the what's the old what's the impact you wanna have in terms of you teaching people and letting yourself letting yourself loose unapologetically letting people know who you are and you're not scared to tell them who you are that's a beautiful thing what is it that you want to accomplish in the next you know x amount of years what is it that you're building tell us what you got going on (laughs) okay man um so I have a thing going on called Born to be Limitless. Now, this is my vision, okay? Because I want people to... Because the thing, when somebody, which I always come across, and I know you will because... And we always will come across these type of people where they they just don't feel like they have what it takes to impact the world, you know? They don't feel worthy enough. And they just like, oh, yeah, I'm just a, a specimen on this planet who, you know, doesn't... I'm not going to... I'm not that big a part to play, you know? Right. And it's just crazy. Like, the impact that I want to have on this world is I want to create, like, a, a tribe of people, right, who work together to change the world, to create personal stories, to inspire so many lives. It is unbelievable. I want to help, you know, is it, it, you know, some people that say it's an impossible goal, but I want to end poverty. I want to end poaching. You know, I want to, yeah. I want to end, you. you know, this. So, huh? I'm with you. God, yeah, man, I, I, I want to do so many things, right? But I realized that to do all these things, you need a team yep. of inspiring individuals, Absolutely. you know, who, because it's the thing, like, with Born to be Limitless, you become part of something greater, and that is to serve the world. Because once you've gone through stuff and you stop living like a victim, you then realize, you know what, I need to serve other people because I've served myself, now it's time to serve other people. And I just want to create a tribe of people who are like, you know what? This world is beautiful. Everyone in this planet is beautiful. And I want to make them know that. And then just start inspiring. That's a beautiful thing. Guys, it's time to put that victim to sleep and put that hero cape on. That's what Wesley Chapman said yes. when he was actually uh, ab- sexually abused for so long. And now he's created a million dollar thing and a foundation to help other people. What you got going on is remarkable. I'm so grateful to have you on. Thank you so much. For coming on Thank board. You. I'm going to put all your links in the description, guys. This isn't the last time that my man Perry's coming on here. Uh, because, again, we have so much more to talk about and whatnot. But, man, Perry, I know you got things going on. Uh, we have uh, finally 
reached its conclusion. Um, again, guys, you know how to get in contact with him. I'm going to put all the links in. Perry Powers. PerryPowers.com, perhaps? Uh, I don't have my own website oh, yet. Perrypower.com. Okay, okay, no. Okay, okay. Not yet. <laughs> mainly because, mainly because uh, I, I tried to. There's a PerryPower.com and it is a, it's a, a farming company in America that stole it. <laughs> <laughs> it's always the Americans. Huh? Oh, no, I'm kidding. That's right. Joke, but yeah. <laughs> um, okay. But anyways, guys, I'll have all the links. You can find them easily on Facebook. Again, um, man, Perry. Much gratitude. Thank you so much for coming on uh, to, and sharing your story. And again, guys, we'll be having him on on some point, uh, you know, either on Facebook or this or that very, very soon. So stay tuned to that on social media. Again, Perry, I'll repeat it. Thank you so much for coming on, brother. Thank you for giving me the space and the opportunity to do so, man. Thank you. Absolutely. And guys, with that being said, I'm going to end this bad boy. Have a wonderful morning, afternoon, and evening. This is your host, Arsenio. Guys, take this message. Run with it. Start writing down your story. And we're going to have so much more coming to you very soon of value. This is your host, Arsenio, as usual, over and out.